Let's open our Bibles to the very first page of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be looking at not just this passage, but actually three other passages in the Gospels today as we think about when Jesus came. Let's stand and honor the reading of God's Word. And actually the, the passages will be up on the screen. Matthew writes, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. You know, the angel had appeared to Mary and made the announcement, and then she told Joseph, but no angel had appeared to Joseph. And it was hard for him, as much as he loved her, to buy this story that she had not been with someone else but was expecting a child. Verse 20, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken of by the, prophet, uh, spoken of by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name, say it with me, Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. God's word has been read, and now may his Holy Spirit apply the teaching and the preaching of his word to our hearts and lives this day. Please be seated. You know what a good, rewarding Bible study would be, would be just to go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and take note of every time that phrase, <clears throat> when Jesus came, is found. Every time you <clears throat> excuse me, come across that expression, when Jesus came. In the Gospel of Matthew, which serves as the uh, first text this morning, in the 8th chapter, we read, when Jesus came to Peter's house. Chapter 9, when Jesus came to the ruler's house. Chapter 13, when Jesus came into his own country. Chapter 16, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea. And the interesting thing to note is, is the difference that it made, the uh, impact or the outcome of each time Jesus came to a home, to a person, or to a region even. You'll discover there is not a single instance where Jesus came to that person or that city that it was not helped or blessed or challenged or even transformed by his presence. And isn't that essentially the message of Christmas? That Jesus Christ has come and things are different. That's the glorious proclamation of this season. That Christ has come into the world as the supernatural force to bestow the life of God. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. We sing the song, light and life to all he brings at Christmas time. I think this truth that we find in our text this morning uh, is demonstrated over and over again in the experiences recorded in the, fourth in the four Gospels. So what I want us to do this morning is just explore some of those experiences to see what a difference it makes. What happens when Jesus comes to the life of an individual? To do that, let's first of all look at this text that we have in Matthew chapter 1. We'll be in Matthew 14, Mark chapter 5, and then John chapter 20. But Matthew chapter 1, this is part of, of Matthew's telling of the birth of Jesus, Matthew's nativity story. The angel appears to Joseph and assures Joseph that Mary has been faithful to him. And the child that she is carrying is actually, was actually miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then the angel quotes the messianic prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth or bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. You know, that world, that first century world into which Jesus was born was filled with religion. All different kinds of systems of religions. Every nation had its pantheon of gods. There were statues and shrines and temples in every major city. Vendors even sold little statues of gods, little idols uh, in the marketplace. Many cities and villages, even families, had their own favorite deities to which they prayed and, and before which they bowed in worship. But while these forms of religions were prominent everywhere, the implicit faith of an earlier time in history 
had died away. Worship for the majority had become nothing but just tradition and an empty ritual. God seemed to be so far removed from his creation, even from his own people, Israel. Skepticism had swept across the whole world. Most folks in despair had abandoned their quest for divine truth. In fact, you remember at the trial of Jesus, uh, Jesus talked about truth and, and, and Pilate just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, what is truth? As if there is no truth to be found. Multitudes were just groping in darkness. It was a time of spiritual hunger. More than that, it was a time of spiritual starvation. And then Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he brought life. He brought God back into the mainstream of the lives of men and women where people could know God and people could fellowship with God and they could serve God and they could love God because that's precisely who Jesus is. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Theologian Paul Scherer defined Christmas as that time when God walked down the staircase of heaven with a baby in his arms. And just as Mary and Joseph wrapped that baby in swaddling clothes, so too Jesus was and is God, wrapped securely in human flesh. Earlier this week, I found a note that was written years ago and given to me by one of our beloved senior adults who is now with Jesus. Uh, it was Joanne Brown. She didn't sign it, but I checked with Jeff. I said, isn't this Joanne's handwriting? He said, yep, that's it for sure. She wrote Christmas. Leave it to children to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. A class of first graders were asked to write and perform a Christmas play about the birth of Jesus. The first part of the play was very traditional. There, were, there was Joseph and Mary, the shepherds, the star. Even an angel was propped up in the background. But the rest of the play was modernized. Behind some hay, Mary was giving birth. The doctor emerged and he said, congratulations, Joseph. It's a God. <laughs> when Jesus comes, what does he bring? He brings the presence of God into our world, into our lives. Because that's exactly who Jesus is. He is the word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. You're in Matthew chapter 1. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. This is the story about Jesus and Simon Peter taking a stroll one night, not along the Sea of Galilee, but on the Sea of Galilee. They decided just to walk on the water together. It was nighttime. The disciples, minus Jesus, were in a fishing boat on that sea when suddenly the wind began to blow, and, and in no time at all, this became a threatening storm. Suddenly Jesus, who'd been praying in a, on the hillsides above that lake, was walking to them on the sea. He was walking to them on the water. And here's how Matthew describes it beginning in verse 26. When the disciples saw him, that is Jesus, walking on the sea, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. Seven years ago, in 2012, there were about 45 of us from Pioneer Drive and some from, from Abilene that don't go to our church. But we were at the Sea of Galilee. And we were waiting to get on a boat and go out in the middle of that sea. And, and we were going to turn off the engine and, and just have a time of, of reflecting. It's, it's amazing. It's not a very big lake. It's, the perimeter is about the size of Lake Brownwood. And uh, it's, it's eight miles across and 13 miles long. And so if you're in the middle of the lake, you can see the entire Sea of Galilee. That's why sometimes it's just called the Lake uh, of Gennesaret or the Lake of Galilee. And, and we were waiting to get on. But a storm, just like the one that Matthew described, suddenly materialized. And the captain said, we're not going out on the water today. We're not, we're not risking our lives. Storms, like the one described here, happen today, just like they did in, in Jesus' day. And they're very dangerous. Boats have been smashed to pieces by those waves. Lives have been lost in the midst of those squalls. So the disciples, who most of whom were professional 
fishermen and professional sailors and knew the waters of this Sea of Galilee very well. They were more than just a little concerned for their own safety. Their lives were caught up in the midst of a storm. And then Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he brought not only the person of God, but he brought the power of God to bear upon that crisis. Peter cried out, Lord, let me, let me walk to you. And Jesus said, come. And sure enough, Peter started walking toward Jesus on the water. But verse 30 says, seeing the wind. Peter, seeing the wind. Now, you know, when we say, I just, I'm, I'm, look at the wind. We're not actually seeing the wind. We're seeing the effects of the wind. On the trees or or, or on uh, uh, the the waves, perhaps, or on a football that's been kicked into, uh, into the wind. If you actually see the wind, it's a fierce wind that you're looking at. And Simon Peter saw the wind and he lost all of his courage. He lost all of his faith and began to sink. But listen again to verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. And Peter didn't sink. Peter did not drown. Now, some folks would say, I wonder if that story really happened. I mean, walking on the water? Folks, it happened. It's told in the Gospels as as an historical, factual truth. This actually happened. And every time I'm on the Sea of Galilee, it's, it's one of the things that I try to picture in my mind. What was it like for those disciples that night with the storm and the wind and all of a sudden Jesus and Peter walking on the water with Jesus? An incredible thing to try to picture. And yet, while this is an actual factual event that Peter and the disciples experienced with the Master, it's also a parable for our lives. So often we too begin to sink when the winds begin to blow and the storms of life begin to assail. You know, when you get the diagnosis of cancer or some other disease or or infirmity, that can be a storm for you. Divorce is a storm that can, can take you down. Bankruptcy, foreclosure, that's a storm that can cause you to sink. But out of our turmoil, as we cry as Simon Peter did, Lord, save me, Lord, save us, Jesus comes and by the power of God, he lifts us up by the power of God. He puts us back on our feet. I call this the Christ factor. It, it's, it's the solution. It's the antidote to any fear factor we encounter in, in life. Christ is available to every believer in every situation. Here's the formula that seems to describe the situation in our text this morning. Simon Peter, long robe plus sandals plus the storm minus the boat equals sink. That's what happened to Peter. That's the human equation. Without Christ, human problems and storms lead to disaster. But then throw in the Christ factor. When you add to that equation, uh, that equation, Jesus, it changes everything. And you get this equation. Peter, long robe plus sandals plus the storm minus the boat plus the power and intervention of God equals walk. That's the Christ factor. That's the difference that Jesus makes. And notice it doesn't say Peter, long robe, sandals, the storm minus the boat plus the power and intervention of God equals fly or soar. As if we mount up with wings as eagles, which Isaiah said sometimes we do, but very rarely do we just soar through our problems. Very rarely does God's power enable us to do that. Just fly over our problems as if they didn't exist. Nor does it say Peter, long robe, sandals, storm, minus the boat, plus the power and intervention of God equals run. Peter didn't just run and skip on the water. He just, as if the sea wasn't even there, as if the storms weren't there. No, just God just gave him the ability to walk. And most often where we are in the midst of the storm and we cry out to Jesus, that's what he gives us, the ability to walk and not faint. That's what Jesus enables us. To do. Do you remember in John's gospel, the prologue of John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, John says, in him, speaking of Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines where? In the darkness. The light shines in the darkness. It doesn't say the light overpowers the darkness completely and pushes it back. Or, or, or the, the light just dispels the darkness. Now, that day's coming. 
by the way. That, that day is coming when the light of Christ and the light of the gospel is going to push back evil and push back the darkness of this world so completely until that darkness just disappears. And friend, you don't want to miss that day. You want to be here when that day comes, when Jesus Christ and the light of, of God completely dispels the darkness of sin and Satan and evil in this world. But for now, for a little while longer, Jesus said, in the world, you are going to have storms. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take courage. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And how has he overcome the world? By his power. When Jesus comes, he brings the presence of God and he brings the power of God. And he also brings the purity of God. Here in Matthew 14, let's keep working our way in deeper into the New Testament. Turn to Matthew or to, to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. This is the story where Jesus gets out of the boat in the area of the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes, and there's a man who is completely oppressed by demons. And they came to the other side of the sea, Mark 5 verse 1 says, into the country of the Gerasenes. And when, he, when Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Jesus had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Well, the spirit did come out and the man was restored to his mental and spiritual and psychological health. This man who was torn apart became a whole person again. And the folks in town heard about it and, and they didn't believe it and they came out to see what had happened. And in verse 15 we read, they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. Jesus had asked him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion for we are many. That was the, the, the evil. That was the, the demonic that was speaking out of him. We are legion. We are many. This man was not a whole person. He was completely fragmented, torn apart by the power of evil uh, that was in his life. His life was ripped to shreds. And he was, he was bound and enslaved by these chains of sin and, and this demonic, malevolent force. But then the Bible says that Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he brought to this pitiful victim of sin's fury the presence of God and the power of God, and he brought the purity of God. And the evil forces that had completely fragmented his life were driven away, and this man became a whole person again. Ryan Harbour tells the story of a church, of a mission in, in Fort Worth, and it, I think it, it aptly or beautifully illustrates this truth. A man gave a large amount of money to this mission at Christmas time. And this mission had a women's ministry, about 200 ladies uh, from what was a, a real destitute neighborhood in Fort Worth were part of that ministry. And so the church decided to buy for Christmas a, a, a beautiful potted plant for every one of those ladies. And one of those plants wound up in a very humble home, meager existence. And the woman took the plant and she put it on a table in the middle of a room and she stepped back to admire it. And as beautiful as the flower was, it made her notice how dirty the table was. She thought to herself, how long has it been since I've cleaned that table, that desk? And so she took the potted plant, set it down, and began to scrub and scrub and, and clean and polish the desk until it just shone. And, and she put the flower back up on the desk, and she stood back to admire it. And, and it was beautiful. The table was beautiful. But then she noticed the curtains behind it, how dingy and how dirty they were. And before her husband came home from work that night, she had washed the curtains and cleaned them and she had, had dried them and pressed them and, and hung them back and they looked so beautiful. Well, the husband came home from work that night, sober for once, and immediately he, he saw the, the, the flower and how beautiful it was. 
And then he saw the desk. He said, my goodness, that desk, it looks brand new. It's beautiful. And then he saw the curtains and said, look what you've done to the curtains. They're just, he took it all in. It was gorgeous. But then he noticed the floor. His vision went down to the floor and he was shocked by how, how dirty the floor was. So that night he rolled up his sleeves and got down on his hands and knees and just scrubbed and he scrubbed and he scrubbed until the, the floor of the whole room was immaculate. And it was amazing how the place began to be in keeping with the purity and the beauty of that single potted flower. If a simple arrangement of white hyacinths placed in the midst of an unkept house can lead to the transformation of the whole home, just think what Jesus can do when he comes into the life of an individual, when he comes into your life, when he comes into your family. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul writes, He, speaking of Jesus, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What that means is when you give your life in faith to Jesus Christ and He comes into your life and brings His purity, when God then looks at you, He no longer sees a, a, a life that's been filled with dirt and filth and, and sin that, that we've allowed to stain our souls and our very, our very being and, and block and hide the beauty that God first had in mind and designed for us to, to radiate. No, instead God looks at you in Christ and sees us clothed in the righteousness of his perfect, sinless, beloved son. Because when Jesus comes, he brings not just the presence and the power of God, he brings the purity of God. He brings the righteousness of God. He brings the goodness and the holiness of God into our lives. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Then lastly, let's go to the next to last chapter of the fourth gospel, John chapter 20. Let's look at this incident that took place on the evening of the resurrection just a few hours after Jesus had risen from the grave. Verse 19, John says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace, peace be with you. Here were these 12 disciples of Jesus, the original 12, minus Judas. They'd had their lives turned upside down by the events of those last 72 hours. Jesus, their Lord, their master, the one to whom they had attached all their hopes and fears of the future. He had been arrested. He had been beaten. He had been executed. And now the disciples themselves, they, they were on the, the uh, most wanted list of the Sanhedrin. Their lives were in danger. They were discouraged. They were disappointed, doubtful, fearful, defeated, and now confused by rumors of a resurrection. There was a, a, a war going on in their souls. And then Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he brought to those souls that were in turmoil the peace of God. I wonder if there's any gift that our world needs more desperately today than that gift of God's peace. Do not the adjectives I just used to describe those disciples in the upper room, don't those apply to the people of our world today, the people of America today? Discouraged, disappointed, defeated, doubtful, fearful, and confused. To them and to us, Jesus offers this lasting, overwhelming, conquering peace. A peace that passes all understanding. It's the peace of heart and soul and mind that Christ bestows when a person is made right with God by placing their faith and trust in Jesus. Generations ago, Phillips Brooks was one of the preeminent pastors and theologians and preachers in America, but he was also a great hymn writer. And one Christmas he wrote the beloved Christmas carol that we sang part of this morning, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And in that last stanza, Brooks included these words, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. 
be born in us today. If I had a prayer for each of us here this morning, a prayer for Christmas, I think it would be that Jesus Christ be born afresh and anew in our lives. That Christ might be born in you, that Christ might be born in me in such a way that we experience afresh and anew the presence of God and the power of God and the purity of God and the peace of God. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Their hearts were sad as in the tomb they laid him. For death had come and taken him away. Their night was dark and bitter tears were falling. Then Jesus came and night was turned to day. So men today have found their Savior Abel. They could not conquer passion, lust, and sin. Their broken hearts had left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. The angel said, for unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. May he be born afresh and anew in your heart and in my heart this Christmas, this day. Let's pray together. Lord, we stand amazed when we picture in our minds... Peter walking on the water and you reaching out and saving him from drowning. We we hear the screams of that man who is torn apart, life in, 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 in fragments. And you speak to him and he becomes a whole person again in mind and body and spirit. We feel the fear and the doubt sometimes that those disciples felt in the upper room. And then you come and you bring your gift of peace. Oh, how we need you, Jesus, the great gift of Christmas. We need you in our lives. We need you in our homes. We need you at work. We need you on our campus. We need you in our church, in our neighborhoods. Make your presence known, Father through your son, as we open our lives to him. Be born anew and afresh in our lives this day, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing our hymn of commitment today. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. If God's moving in your heart to make decision public for Christ, this is a time to respond. Last Sunday morning, we were not able to do that. We had orchestra and everybody was here and some folks talked to us afterwards. Maybe you would be coming today to say, Pastor, we're ready to make Pioneer Drive our church home or we're ready to to come and, and take Jesus as our Savior. He's never been born in my heart, but today there's there's this voice, there's this knock at the door of my heart, and I, I want to ask Jesus in. I need somebody to help me do that. That's what we're here for. Brother Jeff will be here. I'll be here. We have deacons. We have others that would be glad to visit with you. Or right where you are. You don't have to walk an aisle to become a Christian. Right where you are, you can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Come into your heart. Be your Lord and your Savior. And you'll experience the meaning of Christmas, what Christmas is all about. As he brings you the person of God, the power of God, the peace of God, and the purity of God. That can happen today. You come as together we sing.